Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. During this coronavirus pandemic, water and wastewater utilities are currently triggering their response plans for continuity of operations. A significant component during pandemic is consideration of critical functions that include essential personnel whose roles do not allow for telework. Critical services must continue and co-op activities in the face of potentially severe staff shortages and absenteeism is of great concern. This webcast will focus on the role of essential personnel as well as provide insights on the status of activities for a number of utilities. Our first presenters are John Bennett, the Deputy Executive Manager at Trinity River Authority, and Taylor Wen, the Executive Manager of Administrative Services at Trinity River Authority. Welcome Taylor and John. Taylor? Hi, this is Taylor Wynn from the Trinity River Authority. Uh, the, tr the authority has um, imposed several significant measures to help uh, employees, both non-essential and essential uh, personnel, to uh, respond to the current pandemic crisis. First of all uh, and foremost, um, you know, the plan, prepare, and response has been our approach. Um, we assess the emergency response and disaster plan way ahead of um, this, the current situation and also updated the pandemic response plan for all of our facilities. Now, we understand that each facility had uh, you know, additional concerns and therefore we also addressed that and were very sensitive to making sure that uh, we accommodate for some of the challenges that we have at, the in, you know, at each facility. Um, we also imposed health strategies such as performing environmental cleaning with increased disinfection and surface cleaning of all facilities, especially in common places. We added hand sanitizer stations in and made it more available and accessible for employees at uh, multiple locations within each facility. Uh, we imposed restricted measures on catering for, for lunches or um, meetings. Uh, removed community food items and discouraged employees from bringing in uh, shared food items to, with other employees, such as cakes, um, desserts, uh, unpackaged food items, such as fruits that were made available to employees, were removed. We also replaced plasticware um, with individual wrapped uh, serverware as well. Um, rolling out of telework to reduce number of employees in the facilities, added uh, additional shift uh, and um, expanded hours of operation for employees who, you know, we felt that did not want to be in uh, high traffic areas. We made that available so that they would be able to continue to function in their office environment uh, without the concerns of um, visitors and uh, concerns of other employees imposing during their work time. Uh, we added new accounting procedures for the procurement and tracking of emergency supplies and materials, restricted business travel, uh, minimized in-person meetings for employees, visitors, consultants, and rolled out remote uh, tools for uh, meeting and online collaboration tools. Um, Increase HR availability 24-7 by introducing a hotline for employees to reach HR personnel uh, in any event that they had questions. Um, we issued out communication materials via email, posters, and also for those employees do, who do not read their emails, we sent it, we're sending out a mass mail out to all of their residents telling employees to stay sick, all the health strategies, and encouraging employees to communicate uh, about travel for business and re, uh, personal related. Um, we also imposed or introduced new paid administrative leave to accommodate for employees affected by quarantine, caregivers uh, during school closing, uh, closings. We also flexed out on some of our paid leave uh, accrued uh, plans so that employees were not feeling as though that we were uh, imposing them to utilize that, so the administrative leave uh, allowed them to be able to feel better about not you know, overutilizing their PTO or vacation. Communicate a teledoc and remote healthcare access, 
and not requiring health care providers to provide for employees to to provide a doctor's note um, who when they're sick to validate their return for work. Um, I, that's basically it for me, John. Thank you, Taylor. This is John Bennett. And uh, so Taylor has done an exceptional job of providing us with some guidance um, that we need to operate the wastewater water treatment, uh, as well as our collection system group and our regulatory compliance teams. Um, when you have such diversity in your plants, such as we do, in other words, our, our wastewater treatment plants can go to what is a very small plant for TRA of 3 MGD up to our largest plant that's 162 MGD. So some plants may have a total of seven people working in them, while others have, you know, 200 plus. And so trying to kind of navigate the waters, so to speak, to find options that are most equitable and that work best for the specific duties of the employees that are out there can be quite a challenge. And so we've kind of taken the approach of utilizing our general guidelines provided and then honestly uh, evaluate each one of those positions, each one of the critical infrastructure positions that we have and make determinations of, you know, sometimes we can modify schedules a little bit. Sometimes we simply can't. And especially at our smaller facilities, the simple fact is a lot of times those people are working independently anyway. And so, um, you know, they're not exposed to 10 or more people. And so there's not always uh, an absolute need to reduce staffing size or modify the schedules in instances such as that. But when they do apply, we're looking at as creative a way as possible to, to minimize people's additional potential exposure from others. Um, and that can be a myriad of, of different shifts, modifying work hours, uh, time of days. One thing that's pretty important, especially at your big facilities, is that we all tend to kind of have the same break times. So everybody shows up in the break room at the same time. So we've staggered our break rooms uh, usage. We've shortened them to just quick, as we call them, grab-and-go lunches. Um, we have allowed employees to start earlier, so we have some staggered shifts. Uh, and that is, that's really seemed to help quite a bit. Uh, we are uh, working diligently to come up with ways to allow employees to re work remotely. That would be the support staff that's not involved directly in the operation and the maintenance of the equipment. And that's proven to be a little bit of a challenge, but there's some, you know, there's some legitimate workarounds that can be done. And, and so we're kind of modifying our behaviors a little bit and, and changing these strategies to really just fit the needs of the facility. Now, in regards to information, one of the big drivers that I've done and, and that our executive management team has done is to consciously make sure that our employees are getting up-to-date information from credible sources. So the CDC, the WHO, Water Environment Federation have all become sources. As, as great as and entertaining as Facebook and social media can be, you don't always get the most credible information. So in order to try to reduce, you know, panic or, you know, panic's a pretty strong word, but misinformation, you know, we're constantly pushing out this and then making sure information's getting on bulletin boards, getting posted on doors, that the supervisors are, are talking to their crews and, and explaining to them what's going on and, and the best way for them to proceed. Now, from a PPE standpoint, um, in reality, the PPE that we would normally wear in a wastewater treatment plant is quite efficient and effective against protecting our staff against this, these viruses. So glasses, gloves, rubber boots, uniforms, uh, in areas with high splash, and we're going to uh, level C Tyvek suits and uh, face shields. 
in order just to minimize the potential for exposure to a person's face. Um, we are requiring all our employees that wear uniforms and work directly in wastewater to change into street clothes every day. It's a practice they should all be doing anyway, but it's not always the reality. So we do not allow them to take their uniforms home. We also require them to leave their work boots at work. Um, and then something that's commonly overlooked from a cleaning strategy we naturally go to our computers and our work desks and our break rooms and our bathrooms and the doorknobs and the lighting switches, but we often forget the vehicles that we drive and especially those that use shared vehicles. So we've enacted that once per shift, the vehicle that you're driving gets completely wiped down. So that's dashboard, shifter, steering wheel, door handles, everything that people could come in common in contact with within those vehicles and the equipment that's used by staff. We also have limited the amount of people in the car to two. So, you know, we're not packing five people into a vehicle at once. And uh, that's just putting them well within that six foot zone. And just taking the common precautions that you read daily and putting them into a practical application really helps to get your staff thinking. And I think one of the positives that really comes out of this is, is once you do have people focused on facts and you have people that are, that are focused on solutions and they're not in a panic term, then you start really getting good viable information and suggestions back from them. So keeping that, that open communication um, making sure that the, um, your staff knows that they do have a voice, and though not all suggestions can be implemented, that they're at least being considered. And that's, that's really helped kind of embrace a, uh, a collaborative effort. You know, it's us against the virus, so to speak. And to see what we can do, come up with creative and unique ways to continue to support our staff during this time. Now, as I've been discussing, communications within our staff is very important. And a lot of people listening on this call will work at water and wastewater facilities, and you may have a city that you provide water or wastewater treatment to. Some of us out there are regional systems. So for instance, our largest system uh, will serve all or part of 22 cities in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And each one of our systems have at least three cities that we serve. So we realized early on that these cities utilize our services, yet they do not have the technical expertise that we do in a lot of cases. So we decided to go on a uh, utilize a public outreach to help to educate them, ensuring them that our disinfection procedures being used at the water and the wastewater treatment facilities were more than adequate, that our water was safe. In the case of our drinking water, we outlined some of the changes that we were making uh, for that system and chlorine levels and uh, operating the system a little earlier in a different format, a format we usually reserve for the heat of the Texas summer. and also, we utilize uh, biosolids for beneficial reuse in some of our systems, and we did feel the need to make sure that people understood that this was adequately disinfected and that, you know, there was no additional potential of this virus being carried into land applications. That really, that outreach really generated good feedback it, it, you know, a lot of, uh, we really appreciate this. A lot of this, hey, we're gonna take this to our city councils to make sure we can quell fear and, and remove anxiety that we have from the people drinking our water and, and, and utilizing our services. So uh, with that, I believe I am done. Um, I encourage you to send any questions that you have to, to WEF um, and I'm sure they'll get back with the speakers today. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to our next speaker. Thank you, Taylor and John. 
Now I would like to introduce you to Dusty Lowndes. Dusty is the Director of Emergency Management at DC Water. Welcome, Dusty. Hey folks, this is Dusty Lowndes. I'm the Director of Emergency Management for DC Water. As you all are experiencing, our coronavirus epidemic has taken everybody's life by storm and schedules and um, family events and friend events and schedule and work events all have been thrown up in the air. So I wanted to share with you a little bit about what DC Water is working with and how we're trying to cope with and mitigate and respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. So we began on February 26th to start participating in, in the district's preparedness meetings, conducting situation awareness meetings for, with their leadership. And so we turned around and, and started doing that within uh, the authority and held some meetings with our leadership and our union and our staff, began to produce outreach products for our employees, hand-washing information that CDC and the district was putting out. We began to update our COOP, which is about a 350-page document with a lot of essential functions and essential staff, making sure that we had our locations written down and folks' names and titles were all correct. And then we began to look at our pandemic preparedness procedure and looking at that as well and updating that. And we began to review and revise our leave and travel and visitor policies as well. So. We felt like we were pretty on top of it, and then it went to the pandemic, and we activated our team by the 15th of March, and we have an incident management team, which is anywhere from 30 to 50 people at a time who are trained in the incident command system, and we started positioning those people within the command and general staff and started to hold planning meetings on Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, and operational briefs on Tuesday and Thursday afternoons and generating an incident command, I'm sorry, incident briefing document, which will be transitioned into an incident action plan. So, and we're sharing those with our partners. We've reached out to a lot of our um, direct partners with EPA. Our Washington Aqueduct is our supplier for drinking water into our DHS public security or private um, uh, protective security advisor, our PSA, looking at our power company as well, Pepco, and, and reaching out, of course, to um, our partners here at the district within the city administration as well as our emergency management agency, HSEMA. And we're working with those folks um, nearly on a daily or every other day basis to coordinate and collaborate for a common operating picture. So our health department has been difficult to reach. Um, I do believe that we have designated ourselves a point of contact for that person and for those concerns that we have internally with our staff for testing and processes and procedures that we should have for potential confirmed and contact versus secondary contact type um, concerns that we have. So, but then it went one more level, and on March 18th, we declared an emergency within the authority. Our CEO and general manager sent an email out yesterday on the 18th to, you know, basically state we are utilizing our emergency privileges for procurement and staffing schedules. And it also helps us with, um, you know, getting people different workstations and duties as well. So, we have five unions within the authority, and that just kind of covers everybody to make sure we're, we're working together for the, the mission of providing our potable water and our sewage treatment, which is for over five districts within the national capital region. So, so some of our efforts that we've done for social distancing, uh, we created a social distancing work group so we could share within the departments what different folks were thinking to do to keep that separation of folks. Uh, we, we started a lot of shifts, uh, shift splitting. So we took our daily shifts and split them into two groups. And those folks are either stationed at different locations. Uh, one group may even be staying at home, and those folks alternate who's in the office and who's at home. So that's quite new for our staff. We're doing a lot of teleworking. In fact, um, that has been a challenge for our IC folks, our IT folks, for access and programming and equipment. Um, those operators who are work on our plant, 
uh, those folks are pretty much working alone now. They're kind of reporting in only by their radios, and they're kind of just isolated out there um, and reporting to their stations. Our sewer crews have only, and our sewer and water crews have moved only to emergency work, and all scheduled work is put then put on hold. So again, we're trying to utilize the teleworking option as much as possible, which is fairly new to to the authority. We had some approvals for teleworking within, but it was kind of um, taboo to do that. So we we've kind of pushed that button now, and we've got we've got probably hundreds of staff working remotely at this point. So. Uh, we've upped a lot of our disinfection, normal daily disinfection with our contracted janitorial service as well as our facility staff making sure that the provisions are provided on a regular basis. And to minimizing interfacing of staff and warehouse, uh, well, staff for offices and warehouses, we're adjusting assignments, uh, um, adjusting occupied facilities. They're varying their locations and where their work assignments are. We're facilitating a lot of virtual meetings, which is becoming a problem on some of the IT platforms for some of those um, software functions. And we're spreading out and making sure that even we have to be into a meeting, we can't just have a virtual meeting, that we are trying to stay six feet away from each other. So that's been kind of um, interesting and fun to, to play around with each other and say, hey, six feet, six feet. So um, good stuff there. Again, the challenges that we're having, quite a few human resources, of course, with our leave policy, our travel policies, we closed all visitors and all travel, unless it's absolutely essential business, and that even has to go through our CEO. Visitors, uh, we have a lot of contractors, so we're vetting those contractors through a form of where have, where have you been and how are you feeling, and um, any visitors that have to be on site, uh, we're also doing that as well. And our security department is helping us kind of mitigate those measures and make sure that those folks are sort of checked out before we're allowing them to come into our staff, which is so critical to operate the facility. And we're doing so much to mitigate that interface with the potential virus. So uh, just stressing to our staff the importance of hand washing and staying home with, when you're sick. We've run into a lot of issues there where it's just, you know, they're dedicated and we're, we're encouraging them to stay home. The fact that this is a national impact for our supplies, everything is backordered, everything is slowed down. We, we did a, a wonderful thing to ourselves. We decided to go to Microsoft Teams just about two weeks before the end of February when everything was hitting. And so... <laughs> Everybody's challenged at this point to figure out exactly how to use Teams when they're communicating virtually. So that's been uh, sort of fun and frustrating at the same time. Um, it's been difficult to deprogram years of fostering communication, direct in, in, you know, interactions, and to a virtual platform for folks. So that's been an inter interesting too. Um, in declaring an emergency, often when we do that, it also means an administrative closing where we're only going to essential staff, and that is not the case this time. We are open and operating um, as normal as possible with some provisions to to our operations and our mission. But um, so people trying to can you know tell them that you know we're not we're not closing we're just adjusting how we're we're meeting our customers' needs and how we're communicating with each other. Um, other challenges that we have is basically that it's the allergy flu season and that test testing facilities are limited. So we're kind of having to do our own um, healthcare type triage and taking people's questions and trying to can you know talk to them about being a first contact versus a second contact so a lot of education on staff's part to to get familiar with those terms and concepts to help our human capital management folks um, and our sick leave folks work with some of those policies and fairness and alignment within the authority as well and we have some talking points for teleworking and how to manage telework fo folks that are coming out tomorrow, so that'll be good for our staff. But everybody's struggling, and I'm glad I had the opportunity to talk to you today. So please reach out to me if you have anything. I hate to tell you that I'm the planning section chief for our team, so I may not be super available during this event, but anytime afterwards, i be happy to visit with you and work with you, and good luck with everybody. Thank you.
Thank you, Dusty. Now I would like to introduce you to our next speaker, Joseph Lockler, who is the operations chief at Charlotte Water in North Carolina. Welcome, Joseph. Thank you all so much. I'm very happy to uh, have the opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, so here at Charlotte Water, we've actually been preparing um, for this event now for a few weeks. Um, once the initial case was confirmed in Washington State, we started by reviewing our current uh, emergency action plans and uh, plans that allow our operators to, to essentially work at the treatment plants for extended durations of time. So several weeks ago, we've gone through, revisited all of our emergency supply kits, cots, blankets, toiletries, uh, just in the event we actually had to have um, operators or critical staff remain at the plant for extended durations of time. Obviously, we're not at that, that, at that point yet. Um, as of last week, we were instructed by the city manager's office that uh, water treatment, wastewater treatment, um, our lab, which is a state certified lab and not only serves the city of Charlotte, but uh, surrounding counties and towns, as well as the collection and distribution system for Charlotte Water had to be prepared and remain running really no matter uh, what happens for the city of Charlotte and Mecklenburg County. Um, so as of last Friday, all of our critical functions in Charlotte Water uh, developed and started working to implement over the weekend and then early this week staggered working schedules for our um, uh, operators in the plants and in the lab that would essentially ensure that we have qualified, certified staff to operate these facilities. Essentially, what we've uh, decided to do is um, uh, set up A, B working teams to essentially the operations and the maintenance staff are split down the middle. Um, and each team is dedicated to certain working days of the week. Um, at no point in time should there be any overlap of the A, B working teams. Um, this also applies to our electrical and our instrumentation support staff. They are selected and placed on a certain team, and they would remain on that team for the duration that we have to operate on our staggered shifts. Right now, we're planning to operate uh, staggered um, segregated shifts for at least 30 days, but we have measures in place so we could extend that easily to 60 or 90 days. Um, Along with the staggered shifts, we also had to split up the supervisors of the plants, so the ORCs of the water plants, ORCs of the wastewater plants, chief operators are assigned to our working team, and they would remain on that team for the uh, duration that we have to implement this working plan. Um, as I spoke earlier, one of the critical functions that we have to maintain is our, our uh, state-certified lab. Um, we realize that with the lab uh, folks having to go to a staggered shift, it was going to be difficult for them to maintain and continue to turn around relatively quickly the number of samples that we were going to need from the water and the wastewater plants. Um, and so for the wastewater plants, which is that's the group that I oversee and I can speak more intelligently to, um, we actually went to um, a tiered lab sampling schedule to where as if our lab starts to have issues, uh, responds back to us that um, they're not able to keep up, we can systematically cut the number of samples that we're sending yet maintain um, our, our required daily um, permit compliance sampling. So the first thing we've done automatically is all process control, non-essential samples that the lab would run to verify what we are seeing in the plant from a process control standpoint or to verify what's going on with our online instrumentation that has ceased. We've also stopped all sampling in regards to special projects that we would have going on to where we're partnering with uh, consultants or engineering firms for modeling purposes. Um, Obviously, this first week has been somewhat messy as we've had our staff transition from their normal working schedules to the, the um, segregated AB teams. Uh, there were operators who may not have necessarily gotten 40 hours a week, and we have made a commitment as a department that we were going to ensure no matter what 
um, whomever may have been short on hours for the week, we were going to go ahead and make sure that they were going to be paid a minimum of 40 hours. And even when we operate on our split AB teams, there are going to be weeks where some operators are only going to have 36 hours, others are going to have 44. And it's because most of the plants are going to 12-hour shifts. Um, the operators who are only accumulating 36 hours during the work week, uh, we are still going to go ahead and pay them for the 40 hours because this is something that's beyond their control. Uh, they're having to make sacrifices. Uh, right now, they're our most critical asset, and we know that because uh, we have to keep them uh, healthy and in the plants. Um, we've essentially put all of our plant administration buildings on lockdown. Um, the automatic door locks have been put in place to where uh, the doors are locked 24-7. That prevents any visitor, vendor, contractor from inadvertently coming into contact with uh, plant staff. Um, our plants, when they're operating on the AB teams, as I spoke just a few minutes ago, um, each team is responsible for when their shift, when, when teams are sort of transitioning in and out of the plant, uh, the team leaving is responsible for doing a complete wipe down and disinfection of all of the working areas in the administration building. So this would be shared uh, SCADA computer keyboards, shared phones, shared mobile phones, wiping down steering wheels and vehicles that would be used around the plant, uh, disinfecting doorknobs. Uh, so this ensures that one team is leaving their working stations in the utmost cleanest most disinfected state before the other team would come in. Uh, this also happens as shifts are changing on a same team. So daily, all of the common work areas that a team is, is um, utilizing in the plant is, is being disinfected and wiped down multiple times. Um, I should have uh, mentioned earlier, talking about the teams, we've also instituted as part of the, the plan to not have the teams interact with one another um, Really, if, a, if the B team is coming in to relieve the A team, the B team has to remain in their car, their vehicles, until the A team has completely left the plant site, and then the B team can in, inhabit the admin building and start going around and, uh, and operating the plants. Uh, we have multiple construction projects going on at all five of our major wastewater plants right now. Um, we put notice out to all the contractors that work is going to continue, but contractors inspectors, vis, uh, vendors should have no contact whatsoever, in-person contact with um, operations and maintenance staff. Um, we've put drop boxes for packages, whether it be UPS, FedEx, in-office mail, outside of the administration buildings where packages can be left. Um, <clears throat> at office administrative staff can then take the necessary precautions wearing the necessary PPE to retrieve the packages from the drop box and then uh, distribute them um, out into the plant. We have multiple uh, chemical deliveries that are expected each day into our wastewater treatment plants. Um, a lot of times those drivers, we don't know where they're coming from. Um, we're not allowing them in the administration building, but we recognize the need that they may have to use some type of a facility while they're on site. So we've implemented and we've placed port john strategically around all of our plant sites so that vendors, um, drivers delivering chemicals, if they're coming in and they need to use the restroom, there's a place for them to do that. Um, I guess the, the other thing that would be um, sort of good to mention here is, you know, as for most people, we've canceled all in-person meetings. So everything is being done via WebEx, uh, video conferencing, um, phone uh, to teleconferencing, which we're all used to. Um, from a procurement side, we've reached out to all of our uh, chemical vendors to ensure that they are able to supply us our needs in the times that, we've need, that we need it. We've also taken the step to reach out to other uh, chemical suppliers who we may not have contract with uh, to sort of, you know, put notice that we could be calling on their services if for some odd reason our contracted vendors um, could not provide the chemicals that we need. Uh, we've strategically gone uh, with our plant staff that hold uh, procurement cards, which would be a city pr uh, credit card, and have increased uh, limits for daily and monthly uh, transactions to allow for, for quicker procurement of, of needs, goods, and supplies that we may have in the plant. 
Um, I guess the last thing that I'll touch on briefly, uh, just recently as yesterday, we've ensured that all of our plants, um, wastewater plants in particular, have um, access to third-party janitorial services. Uh, so we're we're actually instituting that today. We will have third-party janitorial services coming in seven days a week and cleaning the administration building. So this will be in addition to what the um, operations and maintenance staffs will be doing on their own. And then in the event that we actually have a situation that would need a more thorough deep cleaning or decontamination, we have a vendor on standby that we could deploy into an administration building to, to do a, a much more, you know, thorough deep cleaning decontamination should that um, should that issue arise. Um, I hope the information that I've been able to provide has, has been somewhat helpful. Um, it would potentially maybe give some ideas some, to some people who are listening, that, uh, some things that they could do to keep their operations uh, operating without any um, hiccups or issues. Um, I, I'm uh, very grateful that I've had the opportunity to, to speak with you all today. Um, if you have any questions, they can be directed to uh, webcast at WEF.org. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Joseph. Our next speaker comes to us from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Kathy Davis is the acting manager of the Protection Branch under the Office of Groundwater and Drinking Water. Welcome, Kathy. Thanks so much, and many thanks to WEF for organizing this webinar. There's no high priority for EPA than protecting the health and safety of Americans. Based on current evidence, the risk to water supplies is low. Americans can continue to use and drink water from their tap as usual. EPA has established regulations with treatment requirements for water systems that prevent waterborne pathogens, such as viruses, from contaminating drinking water and wastewater. Coronavirus, which causes COVID-19, is a type of virus that is particularly susceptible to disinfection, and standard treatment and disinfectant processes are expected to be effective. Homeowners that receive their water from a public water utility may contact their provider to learn more about treatments being used. Treatments could include filtration and disinfectants such as chlorine that, could, that remove or kill pathogens before they reach the tap. Homeowners with private wells who are concerned about pathogens such as viruses in drinking water may consider approaches that remove bacteria, viruses, or other pathogens, including certified home treatment devices. EPA supports preparedness planning across the drinking water and wastewater sector by providing resources and tools to states and utilities as they work to provide safe drinking water and wastewater treatment across the United States. Most water systems already have continuity plans in place as part of their best management practices. EPA recommends that states work with their utilities to review their continuity plans. We're aware that there are other impacts to drinking water and wastewater utilities, including staff shortages, supply chain disruptions, field operations interruptions, and inability to maintain all operations. EPA is working with states and water systems to support them throughout this effort. Water systems can contact their state operator certification programs to identify other certified operators in the state and learn about state efforts to support water systems. Tribal systems should contact their EPA regional office. For systems that may need assistance with water system operations, EPA encourages utilities to consider WARN, the Water and Wastewater Agency Response Networks, the Emergency Management Assistance Compact, National Rural Water Association circuit riders, which are funded by USDA, and small system technical assistance providers. In the event a laboratory is closed due to staffing impacts or otherwise not able to perform standard sample analysis for potential water system contaminants, 
EPA recommends that water systems contact their state drinking water laboratory certification program to review their list of additional state certified drinking water laboratories. Additionally, the water system may consider the NELAP or the Water Laboratory Alliance for identifying an alternative certified or accredited drinking water lab. To find details on each of these resources, visit epa.gov slash coronavirus. EPA is coordinating with our federal partners, including the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and will continue to provide te technical assistance and support as appropriate. EPA has published a website regarding the safety of drinking water. We will continue to update the website with questions and answers, as well as resources, as additional information becomes available. Again, that website is epa.gov slash coronavirus. EPA is also working to develop an incident action, action checklist. The checklist can be used to identify actions that water systems can take to prepare for, respond to, and re recover from a pandemic. Thank you again for the time to be on this webinar, and if you have questions, please send them to WEF. And once again, EPA's website is epa.gov slash coronavirus. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kathy. Our next speaker, Steve Frank, is the Executive Vice President for SDF Communications and has kindly agreed to provide us with tips concerning emergency communications. Steve? Your job of continuing to provide service to your community isn't done until you've considered the communication part of it. You have two audiences to consider, your external audience, your customers, and your internal audience, your employees. Let's start with our employees. They often get, get left out because some bosses don't think they need to communicate with them. But this coronavirus situation turns everything on its head. We have to remember that our employees have one power we can't do anything about, the power to withhold. If employees believe their employer is not being straight with them, they can withhold their service. It might not be obvious. They just slow down or they can quit. Either way, we're without the services of a trained worker, and our workers aren't the kind you find standing on a street corner sit with a sign saying, we'll work for food. They're trained and licensed. They're not replaceable overnight. So you have to keep your employees informed. You have to make sure they know what your plans are for operating during this emergency. They need to feel that they've been included. This holds true especially for things like involving them in decisions concerning their safety and providing PPE or personal pr protective equipment. So you have to keep employees informed. You have to make sure they know what your plans are to keep operating during this emergency. They need to feel they've been included. This holds true especially for things like involving them in decisions concerning their safety and providing PPE or personal protective equipment. One of the best things you can do is involve them in the planning. Involving employees in planning for how to staff the plant during this emergency is critical too. It gives them the feeling that they have some say in when they work and how they integrate work into how they care for their families. In my mind, all this falls under the broad heading of communicating with employees. Now let's move on to communicating externally. My experience has been that just when you think nobody's paying attention, some reporter decides that you're the story for today. So we need to be prepared. When I do emergency communication planning, I always recommend that a designated spokesperson be appointed and trained. The last thing you need when the media come calling is not to have given thought to who will say what. Think of this as an opportunity to show your community that you are prepared, that you've given this some serious thought. Even if you don't think you have a message, you do, and it's this. We've prepared for this. 
We've set up work schedules that involve having the smallest number of employees on site. We've halted construction projects. We've provided our employees with personal protective equipment. And we continue to evaluate what must be done to allow us to continue to provide service during this emergency. Keep it simple. Make it memorable. Keep coming back to your main takeaway. We're ready. We've planned for this. If you want to add one more message, add this. You can help us by making sure you don't flush disposable wipes down the toilet. Many people are doing a lot of extra wiping down of surfaces like countertops. Some people are using supposedly flushable wipes for this cleaning. While the wipes are flushable, they don't dissolve in water, and that's a problem for our workers. Because they don't dissolve, the wipes can clog sewers and machinery. So if you use these wipes, throw them in the trash when you're done, not the toilet. And that will minimize our employees' exposure to potentially contaminated water. If the media come calling, be prepared. Do that now. Appoint your primary spokesperson and one or two backups. Make sure you've thought about your message and practice. There's nothing like practice to reinforce your main message. We're prepared to continue doing our job of protecting the environment. Put as much effort into preparing to tell your community that you're prepared as you do into any other aspect of actually preparing to meet this crisis. Thank you, Steve. Our next speaker, Teresa Jakubowski, is a partner with the firm of Barnes & Thornburg LLP in Washington, D.C., where she practices labor and employment law. Welcome, Teresa. Thank you. During this period, you may face challenges in balancing your obligations to maintain your operations while simultaneously satisfying employment law obligations and providing a safe workplace. I will be addressing issues that will arise under the Americans with Disabilities Act, specifically the types of inquiries you may make during this period or types of exams you can require, and also addressing some issues under the Family and Medical Leave Act. There also may be potential concerns under other federal statutes as well as analogous state and or local employment laws. With respect to the Fair Labor Standards Act, it is very important to accurately track overtime during this period as employees may be working longer shifts to cover for those who have to be absent due to illness or exposure. Also, to the extent employees may be working outside their regular positions, you will need to ensure that your determinations of exempt or non-exempt status remain accurate. To the extent that your employees may be expending time donning and removing protective equipment to reduce potential transmission of COVID-19 and or submitting to screenings upon reporting to work, and we are aware that at least one state, Ohio, is recommending that employers uh, adopt temperature screenings for employees reporting to work, you will need to carefully consider whether the law in your particular jurisdiction requires that such time be compensated. Federal and state law can differ in this respect. General non-discrimination and non-retaliation provisions of laws such as Title VII and the Age Discrimination and Employment Act will still apply. So as you are making employment decisions, you need to be aware um, that you need to be able to substantiate that these are not based on any discriminatory or retaliatory reasons. Even if your workplace is not a unionized workplace, you need to be cognizant that collective action that employees may engage in to raise concerns they might have about the safety or other conditions in their workplace can be protected activity under the National Labor, excuse me, National Labor Relations Act. In addition, for those of you with unionized workplaces, 
you will need to be cognizant of your collective bargaining agreements to determine which actions you can take unilaterally to address changing circumstances during this period and which actions you may be required to consult with um, your collective bargaining representative. With respect to OSHA, OSHA to date has not yet issued any specific requirements that directly address COVID-19. However, employers still have a general duty to address known hazards in the workplace. The best approach in this respect is to monitor and follow current recommendations from the Centers for Disease Control and your state and local public health departments. In terms of pre preparation, having an employee communication plan is critical. Informing employees of all the measures that are being done to protect them in the workplace is important to help mitigate absenteeism during this period. Regarding leave policies, on March 18th, Congress passed the Families First Coronavirus Response Act which is scheduled to take effect in 15 days on April 2nd, 2020. Um, that piece of legislation contains two components, an emergency paid sick leave act, as well as expanded uh, leave and provision for paid leave under the Family and Medical Leave Act. The Department of Labor is supposed to be issuing a model notice for employees to post to employees within seven days. So you should be sure to be on the lookout for that notice. Um, to briefly highlight some of the aspects of that legislation, with respect to the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act, that protection is going to be extended to all employees, irrespective of the duration or hours of service. It's basically going to provide for two weeks of paid sick leave in addition to whatever paid sick leave or other paid time off an employer otherwise provides. Um, the compensation for that paid leave will be the employee's regular rate of pay. However, it is going to be capped at $511 per day and $5,110 in the aggregate. This paid sick leave can be taken for um, the employee's own uh, illness or exposure or to actually um, uh, care for a family member who is ill who, or has had exposure and also even to care for children um, where uh, the local schools, the daycare uh, establishment, or the child's uh, regular uh, child care provider is unavailable due to uh, the COVID-19 circumstance. In that case, where the employee is seeking leave to care for a family member or a child, the uh, required compensation is reduced to two-thirds the employee's regular pay with a cap of $200 per day and $2,000 in the aggregate. With regard to the extended family and medical leave provisions, uh, those are being extended to employees with 30 days of service. And again, um, it covers the same uh, circumstances for leave uh, as addressed with the um, Paid Leave Sick Act, and with regard to leave that is being taken um, to care for uh, ill family members, those uh, having um, been exposed to COVID-19 or to, to care for children, um, the compensation will be two-thirds the regular rate of pay up to a $10,000 aggregate. Some other key issues for you to consider um, in your workplace operations uh, are, of course, considering whether customers and visitors to your facility should be restricted 
implementing social distancing to the extent that you are able to, given um, the nature of the work functions that employees may be engaged in, and um, to the extent you may have some employees that can work remotely, uh, enabling them to do so. We do understand that the nature of your industry is such that uh, a number of your employees may not be able to perform functions doing that, but to the extent um, that you can reduce the number of employees in the workplace, that will be of benefit to those who have to remain working. Um, and also implementing the Centers for Disease Control recommendations for reducing transmission in the workplace will be paramount during this period. I've provided to you a sample message um, that you may wish to use uh, in informing your employees of the procedures that they can take to help mitigate transmission in the workplace as well as at home. With regard to social distancing, um, I've briefly already touched on this. Again, just wish to emphasize that there is consideration of the fact that for certain of the um, job functions that your employees may be uh, performing, um, that you will not be able to adhere to the CDC recommendation of a six-foot distance between all of your respective employees. Um, employees nonetheless need to be advised that when they are able to do so, they should maintain those distances to the extent that there is a circumstance where they have to be in closer proximity, when they are perhaps working on equipment, doing repairs, et cetera. Another consideration for you is what other additional measures employees may be able to take during that period consistent with the CDC guidelines to be able to reduce transmission. With respect to inquiries and examinations, the general rule under the Americans with Disabilities Act is that with respect to and current employees, you may not ask any disability-related inquiries or require any medical examinations unless it is job consistent, um, excuse me, unless it is um, job-related and uh, necessitated by a legitimate business reason. However, employees um, can be provided to provide an explanation of why they are not at work. You are free to ask them why they have not shown up to work. You also can ask about their recent travel specifically. Um, the United States is advising against travel abroad. Uh, and there's also some speculation that at some point, if circumstances warrant, there might also be restrictions on travel domestically. So you are able to ask employees that so you can identify if somebody is at a high risk of having been exposed. In light of the public health advisories regarding the COVID-19 pandemic, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission has also um, issued some guidance to let employers know specifically um, some additional types of questions they can ask. Um, if an employee is actually experiencing symptoms, um, you are free to ask, are they having a fever, chills, cough, shortness of breath, sore throat? Um, also, even though um, taking an employee's temperature is considered a medical exam by the EEOC in light of the fact that um, the CDC has recommended that this is one possible way of identifying those who have been exposed, even though we caution that not everyone who has been exposed may have a temperature. Um, the EEOC is recognizing this as a permissible exam because it's consistent with public health recommendations to prevent transmission of the coronavirus. So 
significantly, however, employers cannot ask non-symptomatic employees if they have medical conditions that the Centers for Disease Control indicates could make them vulnerable to complications. This is considered at this point to be an unwarranted intrusion into their personal um, medical information, um, so you should refrain from asking that. Uh, additionally, all medical information must be kept strictly confidential. So again, only employees um, who need to have access to this information um, in order to make a determination if the employee is safe to be in the workplace should have access to this information. Additionally, I'd also like to note, um, while some of uh, some larger employers might actually have on-site or on-staff medical personnel to assist them in making these determinations, um, that many employers do not have that resource ready at hand. Accordingly, if you don't, you may want to, at this point, proactively establish a relationship with a local health care provider who can assist you in making determinations once um, you collect this information as to if a particular employee presents a sufficient enough risk that they should not be um, working in the workplace. With regard to leave, under an, the ADA, employees are entitled as a matter of right to take leave as a reasonable accommodation for their own illness. In this particular circumstance, um, you may also encounter employees because of the nature of their underlying medical conditions uh, who may be at higher risk of serious complications also asking for leave as a reasonable accommodation um, under the ADA's framework, you will need to make uh, an individualized determination in those circumstances as to whether a particular employee is required to be provided leave as a reasonable accommodation. We've already briefly touched on um, the basis for leave under the family Medical Leave Act, and again, I just note um, that during this period, the um, Congress has expanded this to also include simply caring um, for children who uh, require such supervision due to schools or daycare facilities being closed due to the coronavirus. Um, importantly, employers do have the ability to require that employees with symptoms of COVID-19 stay at home. And I know for this particular industry, the concern is maintaining continuity of operations. And so even though you want to encourage having as many healthy employees report to work as possible, you also need to be cognizant to uh, the need to ensure that employees are not coming to work ill and then potentially exposing other employees in the workplace. And then lastly, um, with respect to um, the types of certification you can require for an employee to return to work, uh, in, in Employers are allowed, even in these times, to require a doctor's note of fitness to return to work. You need to be cognizant, however, of the fact that in these circumstances, employees can face difficulty timely obtaining and producing such information. Um, and so you should be to some degree flexible with that to the extent you can, and you also should be aware of the need to potentially accept alternatives to um, a note from the employee's regular doctor or a doctor's office uh, and potentially accepting documentation that may be issued by the local health department or um, types of uh, clinics 
um, that may be offering uh, health care services to the public in general at this time. Uh, and this is also a requirement with regard to uh, documenting absenteeism um, under your attendance policies where many employers require a note for absences after um, three days uh, during this period you may need to be flexible with regard to the type of documentation you are accepting. If an employee in your workplace does test positive for COVID-19, it's important to remember you may not disclose the identity of that employee to other employees. You may inform your other employees that there has been a reported case in the workplace so that they can take appropriate actions to monitor um, their own health and you can determine which other employees might be at risk of um, becoming ill. Uh, it also is paramount at that point in time to inform employees of the steps that you are taking as a result, whether that be um, sanitizing the workplace, the specific area where the um, exposed employee had access, um, whether you're implementing additional protective equipment in the workplace, et cetera. Um, you should also take such an opportunity to either retrain or remind your employees of the steps that they can take to reduce the likelihood of transmission in the workplace. On this last slide, I wanted to leave you with um, some resources where you can provide some additional information. Uh, both of the EEOC guidances that address pandemics and more recently, specifically, COVID-19 are listed here. Um, and I've also provided links to the Centers for Disease Control updates um, and also OSHA's link for guidance on preparing for workplaces uh, and COVID-19. This concludes our webcast for today. Thank you for joining us. For those who might like to ask questions of the speakers or have questions related to the webcast, please email your inquiries to webcasts at wef.org. Additional resources are also available on our website at wef.org slash coronavirus. Again, thank you for joining us today.